Um, so my name is Fred Niehaus. I've been with Cisco for quite a quite a while. I um, I started out doing Wi-Fi. I'm just going to give you a little history, and then we'll, we'll get into this. I started out doing pre-Wi-Fi. It was probably about 1995 when we made a radio that looked like that, and that radio morphed into something that looked like this. And this was the very first client Wi-Fi client ever made. And we did that in 1995 when I started. And along about 2000 or so, Cisco purchased us and we introduced a, a, the very first Wi-Fi certified product. And it's kind of funny, we're a founding member of Wi-Fi. So it was 1995, then we get into, into 97, we start making these cards and things. We hit 2000 and a guy that I was working with said, you know, this is a great Wi-Fi or great wireless thing, but nothing connects but your own stuff. There's no interoperability. So we helped found the Wi-Fi Alliance in 2000. I think it was uh, 1998 or 99 Network Inter Networld Interop. Uh, one of our guys got together with the very first engineers with major companies that were doing early Wi-Fi. And we created this Wi-Fi Alliance, called it WECA, Wireless Ethernet at the time, Wireless Ethernet Compatibility Alliance. Turned into the Wi-Fi name because WECA, you know, Wireless Ethernet was a church up in Canada. WECA was West Edmonton Christian Association. So I like to tell that story because it prompted a, a reason for having a name called Wi-Fi. So, so the, we, we, we helped found this, create the name Wi-Fi, and I think about 2005 or so, it got into the dictionary. And anyway, l l long story short, you know, we, we've, we're celebrating 20 years of Wi-Fi because that's when the standards and interoperability happened recently. And I've been doing it, like I said, for about five years before that. So my name's Fred Niehaus, ham radio, amateur radio guy, NHCPI, Twitter's Ohio Fred. And I wanna talk a little bit about some of the new stuff that we've got. You know, you know, you've probably seen the product line, the 91, 15, 17, 20, 30. Those are our high-end, you know, cool APs, uh, you know, the, the 91, 20, and 30. You've got that RF ASIC and things, but, but I wanna talk a little bit about something we haven't released yet. And I'm actually kind of fired up about it. And that's the 9105. The 9105 is a very small AP. That's just a marketing slick on it. It's a two by two in both bands. It's got an M gig uplink in it on, it's, there's, there's a wall plate version of this AP. And then there's a standard, you know, AP looking access point that mounts on the ceiling and things. And it, um, you know, the use case on this kind of thing, what makes me happy about it is, you, you know, we're, we're talking about COVID and, you know, we'll, we'll, you know, some of our other speakers will talk a little bit about that, but, but this is a very small AP. I can't tell you how neat it is because it, it's, it's really lightweight. It, it, it can be deployed anywhere for like remote workers, for teleworker, you know, the wall plate will work out great for a teleworker because it's got ports on it for other devices, you, you know, it, it's, you know, the, the traditional use case are things like, you know, hotels, hotel rooms so that you can plug in the IP phone and all that or dorm rooms. But now it's remote workers and, you know, quarantine users, people like that. This is the engineering uh, definition of it. it's kind of a little bit dry, but, but the, you know, the product name is, is Catalyst 9105AX, AX for eleven ax And like I said, it's a wall plate and a, a conventional you know, looking AP, it's got, not only is it two by two in both bands, but it's also got all the Wi-Fi 6 features. You know, it's got, got the IoT gateway ability, the built-in you know, Zigbee BLE thread. It, it, the wall plate unit can actually do PoE out, supports about 200 or so Wi-Fi devices per access point. But I'm harping about this size because you know we used to get a lot of grief years ago about the size of the products, you know, and, and, you know, and the weight of the products. This whole Catalyst line, we changed the name from Aeronet to Catalyst because we hired Pinaferino, the same people that do the Lamborghini and Alfa Romero, other car designs, to give us a really good streamlined look. So, you know, in the, in the past, the APs used to look different. Each one, you could look at the ceiling and go, that's a whatever, you know, because you can just tell by the way it looked. Now we're trying to get everything to look, to be uniform, to be as small as possible, as most as robust as possible. But this 9105, if you look at how little that thing is, and I can't, you know, really crow about that, you know, enough because when you look at like this product here, when you look at the AP4800, now we won a Pioneer Award for that product. This product is about five and a half, 5.4 pounds. This AP is about a half a pound. It's not even the size of 
It's not even the size of the antenna array. It's really, really small. Probably the best, you know, it's hard to really understand the size in cameras because it always fools you. But, but you know, I showed you the very first Wi-Fi card. The last Wi-Fi card that we made was one of these. It was a dual, it was a uh, dual band a one. But if I look at that size wise, that a that AP is not much bigger than the card. And if you if I if I do that same trick with the AP, this is a 9130. Look at that. It barely covers the logo. I mean, that should give you an idea how small this AP is. It's also an AP that's built really well. I can take this damn thing apart, pull the screws off of it, and wing that somewhere. And if I pull, if I can get this board out of here, and I'm sorry for the delay, but if I can get it out. I'll show you that it is the inside is shielded. The, the antenna side is all metal. So it's got a great ground plane to radiate off of. And the radios are shielded as well. So you got double shielding, shielding on the radio can, shielding on the inside, shielding on the ground plane. You can't really make a more robust AP. I mean, it's 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 very small. The wall plate is the same thing. It's just, you know, it's it's kind of. You know, I'm kind of excited about it because the last AP that was that size was the 350 that we made years ago. And, they, and it's about the same weight, by the way, too. You know, just about a half a pound. It's real small. The bracket on this AP is, is called an air bracket eight. It does not use the conventional air bracket one and two that we have with every other AP. And I hated that, but, but here's the problem. The bracket from the original AP is much bigger than the AP is, right? So we made a new bracket, smaller, tiny, that'll go on the back of the unit. And um, if, you, if you take a look at the side of it, you know, the port's got a gigabit ethernet port, a console port on, it's got a reset button on, very, you know, same flow and look and feel of the other APs. When we look at things like the wall plate, this has a Kensington lock on it too, but if you look at the wall plate, the wall plate unit's got a side Kensington lock, it's got a USB port. We did not put the USB port on the AXI. We only put the USB port on the wall plate because I want, we're trying to get size thermals and everything as tiny as we possibly could. So this particular AP, the wall plate, is better suited if you have some application for USB or if you have a hotel mobility or hotel uh, or college dorm, something like that, because you can mount this wall plate right on the wall and there's an uplink port and that uplink port will take take you. In fact, that's a that's an M gig port and not a gigabit port. It's an uplink port, and then there's a pass through port. You plug the the Ethernet connector into that, and that if you have an IP phone or something that you want that's in that wall jack. You know, wall jack's got two Ethernet some cables sometimes. Plug the secondary one in there, and it pops out on the bottom. So it's nice because if you have a dedicated IP phone. Ethernet drop or something in a hotel room, you just flow it right on through and then plug the phone in the bottom of the EAP. This access point also has a console port and it's got three Ethernet ports. The first port can do power over Ethernet 802.3 AF, which is 15.4 watt power, provided you power it with 30 watts dot you know, dot three AT. If you can if you can give the the wall plate full power, it can replicate you know, PoE out that port as well. So that's kind of neat. The one thing about these APs that are amazing is if you look at the 9105 AXI, that small, small AP that I just whizzed, that it's 11 watt draw. I mean, this thing has got full Wi-Fi 6 functionality. It's got the faster processor, more RAM, all the hardware that, you know, that you want in the, in the AP for performance, you know, but it doesn't have, it's not a four by four. There's not four transceivers in each band. There's only two transceivers in each band. So we were able to really optimize the, this, this product at 11 watts. So I think that's amazing. And even the wall plate AP will run on AF power down around 13 watts. If you don't have requirements for USB power out and you don't have requirements for PoE out. So, you know, the, the, the idea here is, is everything at 11 watts. Now I've got a kind of a busy slide just to el eliminate the questions. Well, what do the other products draw? Well, I've got a reference slide here where I put all the products down and exactly what their PoE consumptions are. I'm not gonna dwell on that, but have it. The 9105, wall plate and you know infrastructure AP, the MTBF, mean time between failure, I wanna to touch on that a little bit. I'm always getting pushback on that because the competitors, 
the competitor's MTBF is higher than yours. I'm like, well, hell yeah, they measure it at 25 C. You know, if you, if you if you measure an MTBF at room temperature or 77 degrees, you know, that's the longest, best time you could get. Move that thing to 104 degrees where it's going to be in a hot warehouse or a manufacturing environment and then see what your MTBF is. And it, so, so I give you the MTBF here on 25, 40, and 50, just so that you have them. And if you're ever looking at, at spec sheet readers, that kind of noise, throw them the 25C, I suppose, if you're a spec sheet reader. This is just a list of all the software versions that line up with all the products. I kind of thought that would be a little bit helpful, especially since this 9105 is a brand new AP. So that, that kind of introduces the AP, tells you what it's about, why I like it. I'm really thrilled about it because it's just so small and has so many opportunities to, you know, if you, you know, you got a garage, you know, a parking garage, throw that damn thing up in there and people in the, in the garage can know when it's time to go to their doctor's appointment or just, you know, there's lots of different things you can do with it. So I'm going to stop for just a second. And, and if there's any questions or anything you guys want to ask about that AP, we'll hit that. And then I want to start talking a little bit about some antennas. Uh, I have a quick question, Fred. Sure. Um, Fred, we're given your deployment scenario for this access point in dorms and things like that. There's a lot of unplanned networks, and 802.11ax um, is very suitable for unplanned networks. What features have you deployed in this access point that are specifically, you know, ARX, AX specific? Yeah, the, a lot of the elements of 802.11ax is more complex modulation, so you can get more data through in a given radio. So, so when, when you've got an, 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 you know, a phone, you know, you, you know, you talk. They talk a lot about these APs being it's an eight by eight, and it's a you know four by four, and all you know. It means it's four radios or eight radios. But a lot of times that phone's got one radio because the maker of that phone at the time is told. Look, if you put a lot of radios in here, you're going to eat my battery life, you're going to make my phone bigger, heavier, get it hotter, blah, blah, blah. So the features in 802.11ax are things like more complex modulation, being able to get more data through at a given time. You know, there's, there's, there's this thing called OFDM and OFDMA. And basically, the, the, the fastest way to describe that would be in previous generations, OFDM. A train pulls in, all the doors open up, and maybe one guy gets in a car, two guys get in the other car, a girl or two go in the back car, off that pack it goes. With OFDMA in Wi-Fi 6, you're like packing all the cars, and that one packet is being sent out at its most optimal performance. You're getting more data out. So the idea here is, is you know, and, and I'll when I talk about the antennas a little bit, I'll talk about why you can create two different cells and things. The idea here is to get less users on the band or get the utilization lower for faster. So the, the nice thing about this AP is, as a two by two AP, it has all the features of Wi-Fi 6 that help with spectrum enhancement, to be able to, to stop that jitter and to stop that delay, just get to pack it out. So if I can jump in there, Fred, and just uh, ask for clarification. So it's sure. supporting 1,024 uh, 1, QAM, is doing BSS coloring, and what size resource units is it going down to on your OFDMA systems? The, the, oh, you can have up to 32 RUs, I believe. Okay. Off the top of my head, I'm not sure when you, when you scale down the radios how many I'm going to have. I can, I can get back to you on that. I, off the top of my head, I haven't looked at it. Okay, that would be great. Thank you. Sure. Hey, Fred, we, we talked earlier about the, uh, the new APs. They've got Spectrum Intelligence. Uh, I don't believe they have an RF ASIC in them, correct? Th this particular, you know, the 9105 series does not have the RF ASIC. This was designed mainly to be a low cost, easy to, to pop out, you, you know, like popcorn, you know, drop these things around. You know, it, it's, it's designed for campuses, hotels, things like that. You, you know, if, if you're gonna put something in a hospital, something like this could, you know, the wall plate could live in a hospital room, right? But I would want conventional APs in the hospital like 9120s and 30s with the RF ASIC to be able to do full spectrum intelligence, know when I've got interference, things like that. You know, this is gonna have to use the Wi-Fi chipset built into it for any sort of spectrum intelligence. Awesome, thank you. Okay, with that, I'm gonna talk a little bit about antennas. The reason I broke this into two sessions is because, or two uh, different topics. The first one I wanted to cover that 9105 because we haven't released it yet. I think it's really cool to get that out to you guys early to see it. And then in the field, when you deploy products, people don't always understand a lot about radio and antennas. And I just kind of wanted to try to 
you know, go through a little bit of that. If you don't need an external antenna, if you're in a carpeted environment and you're just putting it in the ceiling, you're better off without external antennas because, you know, it's more attractive, it's smaller, it's easier to install, you know, a lot, a lot of things that, that are positive with units that don't have antennas. However, units that don't have antennas are limited. They, they radiate in a 360 degree pattern. You can't focus it. You can't change the cell size. I mean, you, may, you can change the size from a big size to a little one, but you can't cover different areas. You know, when you, when you go into an external product, you know, you can use higher gain antennas that are on, you know, the, the antenna on the internal one is limited, like four or five dBi. I can use a 13 dBi, a much higher gain antenna with the external models. And that allows for farther range. You know, when you have an antenna and you focus it in a given area, it's got two benefits. One is it goes farther. It can hear the client better at, at a far distance. But because it's focused there, it's kind of like your vision. If you're looking one place, you know, you're not seeing the, the noise behind you. You know, so other APs and other, you know, RF problem problematic things kind of go go away in a lot of times with the directional antenna because it's focused in only one direction. It's not picking up crud noise everywhere. So a lot of good deployment. Places for these things are high ceilings, manufacturing environments where you want to aim an antenna one way and, and, and aim another one to cover two different areas. If you've got a hazardous area, like maybe you're a, you know, a, a coal mine or a place that's got knock, you know, a, you know, hazardous gases and things, sometimes you can't have active components in that area. So you could put the access point, you know, inside, you know, away from that area and put the antenna outside. Or the same with like a, maybe you're a freezer and, and the tow motor drives into the freezer and the freezer's all metal. And, you know, and as soon as it goes in there, it's dead, you know, where if it, you know because it's, a, it's an RF cage. Well, you can put one of the antennas in a freezer, out of a freezer. There's just lots of reasons why you want external antennas. And hey Fred, real quick, could you, could you just explain a little bit? Because I think it's important. I think a lot of people overlook it. The distance of AP is off of a floor. Um, could you just go into a little bit about like how high is too high and maybe specifically for these particular APs? Sure. When you, when you look at a product like the, you know, the 9130 or any of them, you've got an antenna that that's very fixed. Okay. It's this, you know, this, this little element right here. And when it, when the antenna is mounted the way it's supposed to be on a ceiling like this, it radiates down and outward in a 360 degree pattern, but it's limited to whatever the gain that antenna is. And once you start going higher and higher and higher, part of the problem is that if I've got more than one access point, say I've got, you know, the, you know, I've got the access point here and another one here, and we're way up high on a ceiling, the strong signal from this one is at the same exact plane as the other AP, way up there at 35 feet in the air, however high it is. So they start to hear each other. And then RRM says, hey, you know, I got a great signal over here. I'm going to start turning power down. Well, it's turning power down. It's killing your client down below that's 35 feet trying to get up, right? So, so sometimes it makes sense, you know, if, to use a directional antenna like a patch antenna. You know, they got, you got antennas like this one. It's basically a 6 dBi patch. And you could put something like that up on a ceiling and angle it down, you know, 35 feet to cover a long aisle way. There's no one way to do this. You, you know, it, it's, you know, if, if you use use the, the features that, that I'm gonna talk about a little bit called flexible radio architecture to, to create, you know, like two five gig radios, things like that. You can do that up in a ma manufacturing area and cover it. And, uh, you know, but, but these antennas use conventional, uh, what they call RPTNC connectors, right? There's different different kinds of connectors out there in the industry, you know, there's N connectors, RPT and C connectors, and when you're trying to make a decision as to what to do, it's kind of hard to really understand that. So let me let me dig into that just a little bit. All right, let me ask a quick question, and, and sure. I think you're probably going to cover this, and, and and you can absolutely tell me that, and 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 I'll and, and we can no, do no more. worries. Go for um, it. One of the problems I see with a lot of access points, and I'm curious on, on if Cisco's this, this way, is you guys have, you're adding a lot of extra radios in, right? You're either ad adding radios in for diagnostic purposes, for 802.15.4, uh, you know, all, all of those other radios, but often those radios aren't actually hooked up to antenna lugs or, or anything else, right? So as soon as you put a directional antenna on that, the the reception and, and the the signal coverage that you're getting for those for those uh, additional radios 
are not what you're getting from the client serving radios. So, so I'm seeing that on, on APs across the board and, uh, and I'm not putting it specifically on Cisco. I'm curious to hear from Cisco about that. Um, that obviously creates its own problems, right? Sure. Uh, a cu couple things. If you are, if you're using a feature like BLE, right? BLE require, you know, you know, it, it, it beacons, right? So, so you, you want the AP in the, in the near field of the person and beaconing, right? If you go to a directional antenna, it's going to be going where, where you're pointing it, right? So you have to look at it. You have to take into consideration that we did an awful lot of things with the 9130 because the 9130, if you, if you take a look at the two pictures here, the 9120 has four RPT and C connectors, and then there's a, a four port dart on the side of it that allows that to, to bring it out. So, so by default, you have 2.4 gig and five gig on the four RPT and Cs. That way you can take that antenna I just described to you, screw it right in and go. Now in that case, what happens is you have a 2.4 gig radio that's in four by four mode. When you decide, gee, I'd like to use the IoT functionality and, or beaconing or Zigbee or whatever, what we do is we shut off port D, you know, one of the ports on, on the 2-4 side of the AP, turn the AP into a 3x3 three three for 2.4 gig, and then a 1x1 one one to do the BLE beacon. So in that case, if you screw this, this uh, you know, patch antenna, 60BI patch to this antenna, and you pointed it in a given way, that's where your beacons are going to go because I don't have the ability to beacon from within the AP while you've because you've asked for external antennas. When when you go with an internal unit, I can lay all those elements inside there and I can keep them to where they're all in a uniform 360, no focus or anything mode, right? But but we, to take it one step farther, and I don't have a slide that covers this. I'm just going to talk about it a little bit. When you go and you switch to a when I decide I'm going to take that bottom one, that 9130, and I'm going to plug this antenna in, boom, I plug it in. Now I've got two sets of four cables. The first set, A through D, do all of the 2.4 and 5 gig Wi-Fi. The secondary set will do the 5 gig in 8 by 8 if they're together covering the same cell, or you can say, I'm going to break it up and I'm going to do a four by four Wi-Fi, five gigahertz AP this way, and maybe a four by four Wi-Fi, five gig and two four that way. When I do that, the two four is only going out the primary, you know, four. So I can't send anything Zigbee or, or out the secondary five gig. So if I have two antennas going two different ways, the BLE and stuff is only going to go where the primary one is. And one thing that's not documented too many places is the RF ASIC that listens for things like interference and determining whether or not a channel is clear to use or not and all of that. Well, what do we do with that? We actually use two ports on the RF ASIC and we mux out the last port antenna on each connector for the RF ASIC. So even if the RF ASIC is pointing two different directions, you know, we know which antenna heard it and we can respond to that five gig only without trashing the whole damn thing. You know, so so there's a lot to it, but but what what question specifically do you have if any on on how it works? Well, I think I think you actually answered that really well and it's also really useful to know about the way you're attaching the RF ASIC. That's uh that really kind of changes design methodology in my opinion in, in with with antenna placement. I do have one follow-up question. Um, I know in the past um, it's been this way, and I'm curious to see if it's still that way with 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 um, with AX and the latest APs. Um, Cisco in the past has only beacon for Wi-Fi out of the the first antenna lug, right? Is that still the case? And and my um, the argument I often make with other wireless engineers is if that's the case, we have to be absolutely certain that we're orienting um, that the, um, the the antenna that's on that first lug correctly, or we end up cross polarizing. Do you feel like that's a, a challenge? And is that something that we have to? Uh... Uh, yes, and yes, and no. I mean, I mean, we beacon out the pri pri primary, that's more in a two four world. You know, what I'm what I'm thinking out loud is, is that, you know, is yes, if you're doing legacy data rates, we beacon out that way, I believe we still do it with Wi Fi six. But 
we've changed a lot of the radio. We're, we're using, you know, my Cisco badge says no technology religion, right? Well, that's true. We started out making APs using a Marvell chipset because we could take our Cognio acquisition, that what was basically the, the genesis of the RF ASIC, if you will, and build that right into the Marvell, uh, you know, uh, silicon. And so we were kind of like tied to the axle there, you know. And but the thing is, is there's a lot of is these chipsets go out, right? You know, you, you you know, we made a 9117. 9117, you know, is an eight by eight, but it's not the 9130. The 9130 can do everything and pass all the Wi-Fi things, but but the 9117, you know, they were still making the spec at the time they were doing. So that chipset was limited, right? So what I'm saying is, is these chipsets. You know, the core chipsets and how they work are very similar. So I don't think that that, yeah, I'm not sure that that beacon thing is going to bite you or not. You know, I mean, I, I would look at that and do some testing on that. I, you know, I not seen it to be a problem, but, you know, it could be, you know, certainly wouldn't, wouldn't lie to you and say, not, not a problem, you know, but, but I, I would, yeah, I mean, the problem with this, with this kind of a talk is, 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 you know, it, it, I'd rather if I know the truth, tell you. If I don't know, tell you I don't know. But and and, and, I'm, and I'm just thinking out loud that that I don't know that we're going to be doing things a lot differently than our competitors do when we're using the same sort of chips. Yes. Yeah. And 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 we appreciate the honesty. Thank you. All right. Okay. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about the 9120 because remember I told you that the, the that the difference between these two here is the 9120X has RPTNCs and a four port Dart. The 9130, we got rid of all the RPTNCs and we have an eight port dart on the bottom. So I wanna to touch on the 9120 and then dig into the 9130. So if you look at the 9120, you know, you, you can use a four port adapter that will get you to RPTNC connectors. And this product has two versions. It has a, a Catalyst 9120 and a, and a P version, professional install for antennas up to 13 dBi. Using the, the 9130, we don't need to have a, a special version, but, but looking at this product here, it's very straightforward. You know, by default, you could just put dipoles on it, you know, make it look, a, you know, make it look like the conventional AP, put it this way if you want, and, and they're all dual bands. So you don't need the DART. If you're running in dual band mode, you don't need the DART adapter or anything like that. If you choose to take this product and say, you know what, I want it to be, but, you know, well, let's look at the next slide. So, say I take this product and, and it's dual band, five gig, two, four, but I decide, you know, I'm willing to sacrifice that two, four to get five, right? So if I do that, I can switch it into two, five gigs. Now, once I do that, I can't have two, five gigs on the RPTNCs on the top of that product because the, <laughs> you know, you're at the same band, same frequencies, you just can't do it. So as soon as you switch to dual five, we take the secondary five gig and we go out the dart port and now you've got a, a, a situation where you have this antenna, maybe the patch antenna is on one of the, you know, on the RPTNCs and it's doing two, four, or I'm sorry, it's doing five gig only at that point. If you choose dual five, if you choose two, four, it does two, four and five on that. And then the other dart connector allows you to plug in a separate antenna for a different direction. So it's a lot cleaner to do that, I like the dart. The, we did this whole dart approach mainly to, to limit, eliminate, you know, 5,000 of doing this. You know, you know, if you've got to install something, you know, my, my mom had a, oh, a, a minor stroke recently. I was at the hospital looking at that. And I'm like, you know, that antenna isn't even screwed on. One's pointing this way. And, you, you, you know, things just kind of degrade sometimes with RPT and C connectors. And it's nice to be able to plug in everything with a dart. If you look at this product also, this does something no other AP I think in the market can do, at least none I'm aware of. There may be a competitor that does it, but I don't think so. If I wanted to, I could send, instead of having 2.4 and 5 gig on the top, I could send 2.4 out the dart. I could actually split this into single band products. Why would I want to do that? Well, maybe I'm the military and I want to take that 2.4 and upscale it to a different frequency. or I want to go do something else with that, totally unrelated to maybe what most people would do. But I fought to have that ability to, to be able to switch things in and out on RF and, and give you the flexibility that you want to be able to do it. So, so that's kind of the, the 9120. The 9130, 
like I said, that's our flagship. That's the best product that we make. That product is, is a true eight by eight. It's got this tri radio, which means it can do dual five and 2.4 gig. When you ship, when the thing ships, it looks exactly like the 9130 AXI, like the internal one, except there's a yellow cap there. You pull the yellow cap off, you now have all your eight antennas and you have 16 lines of digital. And the idea here is a single insertion. You know, if, if I wanted to install this product, I don't have to screw all those RPTNCs, do the cable management, all the mess. You know, I just, it's a one plug in, I'm done. So that's, that's really where it, it shines. If you look at how that breaks down, the default mode is you've got five gig and eight by eight, 2.4 and four by four. They all flow out the dart. If you look at how the dart is, and I didn't put the RF ASIC and the IOT and stuff on this, this thing, it's a pretty simplistic chart, but A through D is dual band and the IOT goes out D, you know, we'll shut off D and put it in three by three mode if you need IOT out of it. The five gig is the secondary five gig or it's the primary five gig if you're running in eight by eight mode. Now, as I mentioned before with the 9120, you had to have a professional version if you wanted to use antennas 13 dBi or so. What we did is we made two Dart, ad two Dart adapters to get you to conventional connectors. The first Dart one gives you RPT and C and allows gains up to six dBi. If I wanna use a 13 dBi antenna, there's a dart with N connectors. And that way it'll screw onto the stadium antennas, things like that. We're designing a lot of different antennas for this product. I'll touch on a few of them in a bit. But you know, why do you wanna go from eight by eight to two four by fours? That's probably a, a question. You know, what's the benefit of this tri-radio, right? Well, if I wanted to send the signals into two different areas and create two different cells rather than an eight by eight, I now have that ability to do it. And I'm the only product that I know of that can do that today. And, you know, not all, all use cases benefit dual five gig. I mean, you know, you might have, have a case where you're in a convention center or something and you have, you know, tons and tons of Wi-Fi six clients. And you know what? I want multi-user MIMO to work in its full bang mode with eight by eight and everything running. You know, I might want it in eight by eight mode, you know, or I might say, I'm going to take part of that convention area or whatever, break it off into two different cells is five gig this way and five gig that way. You, you know, it's all about, you know, flexibility. You know, I mean, marketing people, it's investment protection. Yeah, yeah. It, it's about flexibility. It's about being able to take that RF and do the things that you want to do with it. Maybe I want to make right. a five gig cell outside and do two, four and five inside. I could split it out and cover a park area or something. Question? I, yeah. Um, so you mentioned earlier that you're working on um, a variety of antennas. Um, it still seems like there's every once in a while a, a missing antenna that I might need for a design. Can you comment on third party antennas or compatibility by any chance? Absolutely. Let, let's hit that real quick. So I can retire off of the things Cisco doesn't address. Okay. <laughs> and there's a lot of antennas and things out there. And we've taken, uh, you know, Ventev is a great partner. Excel Tech is a great partner. These people, you know, we, we're, we're allowing them to make, we've given them the full specs on, on this dart connector. So they'll be able to make unique antennas as well. Now, what's what's neat about this dart connector is that once it goes in, you know, I had a picture of it earlier and I showed 16 lines of digital. We can read what is inserted in that unit, right? So we're working with partners so that when you take a partner antenna and, it, and you put it in, it'll know it's it's an Excel tech or a Ventev. It'll know what its gain is. You know, you know, we're working on trying to build up a partner ecosystem to work with that, but What's nice is that they have that spec. When, when, when I do something simplistic, like I say, these two dart adapters, there's very, very limited logic in that dart adapter. One, the, the logic in the, in the one for six dBi, it's just jumps with GPIO pins and the things say, this is a six dBi antenna. That's all it is, right? The, the 13, it's 13 dBi. It doesn't tell me whose antenna it is, what it is, because it's not using all of those 16 lines of digital to be able to do that. So some of these end partner antennas will just use that nomenclature. They, you know, the, the partner antenna may only be six dBi. So they just, you know, they might put the logic in the dart for six dBi only, you, you know, and you plug it in, it just runs. We're working to try to get them to give us all the data on the antenna, you know, the gain, who makes it, all of that, maybe even the serial number, and get that stuff bubbled into to the higher, you know, management layers and things. 
Make well, with the, the, the 13 dBi DART adapter that you've got there, it does reduce the transmit power of the access point to compensate for the assumed 13 dBi antenna, correct? Exactly. So the part of the problem is that when you don't do that, your out of band emissions, your noise and everything creeps up. And then, you know, if you look at a spectrum analyzer, it's like, you're not good. You know, there's a lot of, a lot of our competitors, especially the ones that, that aren't as big. They're not, not our big competitors, but the littler ones, they just put that stuff out and then they get found in violation, have to do recalls. And, you know, Cisco's got, got deep pockets. The last thing we want to hear is that we put 5,000 things up at 35 feet and now it's not legal. Who's going to pay to rip it all down? You know, we, we, we build, we build this stuff with built in safeguards and things to prevent that. So now we, we're no longer responsible for going in and setting antenna gain. Um, it, it's doing it automatically. Is, yeah, there but, a way, is there a way of overriding that? So let's just say that we're, we're using a 6 dBi antenna that actually has N-type uh, lugs on it. So we're using the, the 13 dBi dart that's actually only 6 dBi. Is there a way of overriding that or is it just just Well, if you, were, if you were to plug in a 6 dBi antenna, you know, a dart adapter, you'd have RPTNCs. If yeah. you all of a sudden then put a 13 dBi antenna on it, okay, you know, you could argue, yeah, well, I went in and I turned the RF power down. I did, you know, did these things and I'm okay, right? And you may be okay. You may not be okay. The the, the problem with that is, is can you defend it, right? right. And what, ha what happens is you might do something that's totally legal and defensible for you, but then you, the IT guy leaves. A new IT guy comes in, he defaults the AP, it's running at full power, he's found in violation, and the next thing out of his mouth is, well, Cisco sold me, this ain't my fault, it's not, you know. So, so we do all of the things to prevent you from going left to center. Okay. Can you go left to center? Oh, well, yeah, I could take that 9105 and take it apart and bring the antennas out and do all kinds of things that may or may not be sure. legal, you know, and, and, sure. and that's why I love that 9105, because it's so little and it's just, you know, you know, I can put three of them in an, in an area and take no space, you know? So. Right. Yeah. But and, a good and, RF engineer reason, will make sure that you're in regu regulatory domain compliance at all times. Right. right. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 And it's, it's not so much, I, I'm not so much concerned about whether or not I can exceed, you know, compliance. It's more about if for some reason I'm using a lower DBI antenna that happens to have say N type connectors, can I, you know, can I enable it to put out that 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 yeah. higher power? In general, you, you let's be honest. In general, if we're if we're coming close to matching our clients, we're not going to get close to that anyways. But right. that was just kind of the. I just wanted to know if that was a software yeah. setting. If I gave you that knob, it would be hard for us to defend it if it was running that way, right? Like like RxSOP, which did, did, to get off tangent a little bit. Sure. RxSOP, you know, receive start a packet. I, I, I call it receive squelch, you know, you know because you know, <laughs> you're turning up the squelch so it doesn't yeah. hear, right? And, and, you know, if you do that, you, you know, you can run an environment. I've got an AP that's, you know, 40 feet away or whatever, making all this damn noise. I could RxSOP that thing all the way up to I don't hear that thing. You know, I can keep running. And, you know, is that a good thing to do? Well, you know, what happens if, if you're, your last day at work, you turn RxSOP on all the APs so high they can't even hear them and you check out? <laughs> you know, how are you going to figure that out, right? You, sure. know, you, you know, we, we try to do things to keep you from going left to center. Uh, if you got, if you throw money at it and time at it and skill, you can do damn anything you want. Okay. Thank you. Hey Fred, I have a question for you. Um, on the um, the ninety one thirty data sheet published by Cisco, and I hate to put you on the spot with this question, but it says on there that the tri radio mode and uplink multi user MIMO will be available in a future release. Can you confirm that it's actually available today in today's release? Yes, I believe I believe it is available today, okay. and you know, with, with the latest code. Um, you, you know, I I'm not a lab rat. I mean, I, I haven't tested a lot of the things you know, on, on the end of things, but uh, but yeah, if, if it's not on by now, it, it's it's a fair grouse. So then it must be a, a documentation well, the spec problem. Sheet, the, the problem with the spec sheet. Uh, let me let me hit on that. Every time you write a doc, and we do this all the time, we create matrices and we say this works, with this works, and this works. You know, two weeks after you've done that, it's old, right? And 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 I I think that that spec sheet likely needs revised. You know, and and if I'm wrong and it's still not in there, when I get off this call, I'm gonna make sure it is and and, and push it hard if it's not. The the compatibility matrix seems to indicate that it's currently supported in shipping. Yeah, code. I believe it is. You know, cool. Thank you. Okay, so I explain why you might want to try radio, why you might not. You know, a lot of different things. 
Uh, this is a slide that's older than I am, I think, but, but it, it kind of, it, it tells you a little bit about before there was Wi-Fi 6, you had to do things that would make channel utilization get lower, right? So, you know, if, if you're on a single channel on an, on an AP with omnidirectional antennas, everybody's on connecting at whatever speed they connect at. The people close in connect at a fast speed, far away people slower speed. In that kind of a scenario, you got like the channel utilization is like at 60%. And, you know, for just to put a number on it, right? If I can take the AP and use this FRA flexible radio, create two five gig cells, make a micro and a macro, then the people close in connect at their more uniform, faster speed. The farther ones connect away at their slower speed. And I've taken two channels now instead of one. So instead of one channel, 60%, I'm on one channel at 20 and another channel, say 24%. So I've, I've dropped it from 60% down to 44% and also split it across channels. So the takeaway is the user gets less retries. It's a better experience. You know, now BSS coloring, a lot of other things are trying to do similar things by turning power down. If you're a client, you know, you know, the, you know, we did this on the AP side. Unfortunately, we had no ability to change it on the client side. So BSS coloring will, will kind of let it know about things, let them coexist, turn power down a little bit on them. And it's a more granular and a, probably a better way of doing it than this. But this today with legacy clients is still a, a huge thing. So, you know, it's, it's important to be able to do those kinds of things. So I mentioned the antennas and the fact that you could take an antenna like, oh, like this, this can antenna here in the middle and with a one insertion, plug it directly into the AP and be done. That's, that makes installations easier. It makes a lot of things, you know, better to work with. We've got three antennas that came out the gate when we released the AP. The 9101 is a ceiling mount omni. In other words, instead of putting the AP in the ceiling, you could put the AP above the ceiling in a metal lock box and put the just the antenna down below. You know, that's one option. Then there's a pole mount omni, the middle one, where, where you in a manufacturing environment, you might put that on an eye off of off the left of an eye beam to, to cover a 360. And then there's that 2566 patch I told you about. You know, that antenna I was waving around that flat panel one. You know, instead of having a flat panel antenna like this and then a cable mask go into the AP, what we did was we created this new look. We made the, the antennas actually look like the APs. We, we put an LED in them so that they flash. We, we, you know, so it mimics the LED on the AP. All three of these antennas have LEDs on them. We changed the design of the 6DBI so that you could use a bracket nine behind it, stuff the AP right behind the antenna, and have a have a directional, you know, a, a directional 6dBi antenna to go down a hallway or in a, in a manufacturing environment, other places, and have it look like the AP. It's just a little bit bigger looking AP, and then all the cables are hidden behind it, and it stops this this rat's nest that you see over on the right, you know, where you you got cables going one way and another way, and and all that. So that's that's kind of neat. Uh, there's a list of approved antennas for this product. You know, I just put a, just took this right out of the hardware installation guide. Be, you know, just so you, if I'm going to give you the POE draw, I might as well give you the antenna, uh, you know, approved antennas. To go back to Sam's question about third-party antennas, as long as the third-party antenna lines up with one of these. In other words, if, you know, because these are the antennas that we took to the FCC and certified for compliance, right? So if... If a third party company makes a 13 dBi antenna, that's great. If they make a 14 dBi, we didn't submit that for qualification, right? And it, you know, and it's possible that you know we can through the dart connector have a, a 20 dBi antenna and dart it up so that the AP you know turns everything down like it does for 13 down to the 20 or whatever. But that's more futuristic. That's more you know what we're going to do in software later. You you know when you make a piece of hardware, and I've, I've said this a lot of times, it's like making cupcakes. You pull it out of the oven. If the center of that cupcake's gooey, you can't go back and recook it. Okay. So the hardware is able to do many many things and you and you'll hear things like you know our basic our fingerprinting and all of these other you know you know we, we tout things that are hardware capable and then time tells whether we put the energy and the software to do it right so so right now this product supports these antennas any third party antenna that's of like design and gain may be used and it's and it's really simple to to, to look at the chart and see if if somebody decides to make something 
at a much higher gain, we probably have to submit it for qualification or work with them in a third party lab to do it. But, but that's, that's the antennas. And then I got one last slide and that's, that's just in theory kind of stuff. It's kind of a goofy slide here, but, but what I wanted to say was, if you can split that connector and go off into two different directions with two different antennas, if you can, don't put them so that they aim into each other, don't put them too close together. You, know, you get RF isolation a lot of different ways. You get RF isolation by getting distance away from, from each other. You get it by height separation. If I have two omni antennas, remember an omni antenna you know, looks like, looks like this, radiates in a 360 degree pattern. It doesn't end fire, right? It doesn't send the signal out the top of it, it goes around. So if I put an antenna here and then I go up five, eight, 10 feet on the tower, put the second one up, they're not gonna shoot down at each other. I'm gonna get better isolation using height separation than I do side by side, because side by side, they're both going into each other, right? You know, so when you do this, you know, you get isolation by turning transmit power down. And that's what we do with the internal units. When you look at an, an internal AP and all the antennas are inside, we, we create a micro and a macro cell because the micro, I gotta turn the power way down to get my isolation, you know? So, you know, you don't wanna do a dumb mistake by doing an install and pointing the antennas too close to each other or pointing them into each other. You know, keep in mind the farther away frequency wise the antennas are better isolation. The lower the transmit power on one of them, better the isolation. Polarity, if, if something is vertically polar, polarized, which is normal, maybe on an outdoor link, I go to horizontal polarity. You know, maybe I've got a vertical polarity doing clients in the near field and a horizontal backhaul link or something, you know. You, you know so, so polarity can help you height separation, physical separation, things like that. There's no one way to do it. You know, you kind of have to test it and see what works. And in the picture over to the right, they took, the, this is a, like a 3800, they basically took a patch antenna to shoot up the escalator. So at, at Cisco Live, if you had your phone, you got connectivity riding the escalator, but the, the other five gig radio and two fours pointing at the registration desk, you know? And so I've got two completely different cells running in that environment. Or I might take a, product, you know, you'd mentioned about different gains and things. I might take an antenna that's supposed to be this way to go out really, really far. And I might put it on a tripod, put it this way. So it shoots right in the ground. What I'm doing is, is I'm forcing myself to have a much smaller cell and I might litter more of those out there. So, so you can play with external antennas. You know, external antennas are a huge deal in my opinion, because if you're an RF expert or, a, or a, somebody with, with, with the knowledge of doing it, you can do so much when you can control that antenna. It's kind of like, you know, yeah, you know, it's like an audio buff, right? You know, this, the, the speakers and, you know, that are this big aren't as good as the, 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 you know, when you can focus and do things, right? So I kind of think of it like the difference between the speaker and your phone and having a big horn out on the stadium or fairgrounds, you know, shooting out.